time for me to take two stings from the Portuguese man o' war. Two sting sites, two different antidotes. Which one works the best? You're about to find out. Ooh, man, I'm getting nervous. Tear of the ocean, here we go. One, two, three. Oh, man, that one nailed me. One of the things I almost see in every single comment section is, Mark, when are you going to take a sting like Coyote? Well, truth be told, I do get stung by quite a few things on our adventures. But one of the things we have not featured yet that I'm stung by all the time is, of course, the jellyfish. I'm hearing a lot of bad information out there about how to treat a jellyfish sting and what the sting is actually doing. So when I decided that we were gonna make this video, I was like, what jellyfish should I get stung by? A little tiny one out on a reef? Oh no, I need to go big. We're talking the baddest the terror of the ocean, the Portuguese. That one. Yes, that's exactly what we're looking for today. Now, when the wind blows a certain direction, the Portuguese man o' war will actually wash up on the beaches here in Florida, sometimes by the hundreds. Actually, I think I see one right up there. Oh, all right, here we go. Those are two pretty good looking man o' war right there. Woo, careful guys, don't wanna get hit by, whoo, that is dangerous. If I get whipped by that, we're gonna get stung way, whoa, way sooner than I want to. So everyone knows this is the end for them. When they wash up on the beach here, they will unfortunately dry out and that's kind of it, circle of life. So the fact that we're taking these two today for our experiment is totally a good use for their end of life. And boy, do they look beautiful. But sometimes with beauty comes pain and this, is a super painful jar. All right, let's head up out of the wind and take a closer look. I remember these tables, except all of the shoots before this one, I was on the other side of the camera. So yeah, this is uh, a little bit different than I'm used to. In this bucket, we have a variety of different sting remedies. Some of them good, some of them not so good. And that's the reason why I wanted to make this video in the first place. Let's talk about the organism, the creature, the Portuguese. Are we gonna do that every time? The Portuguese man o' war. Although it looks like one, the Portuguese man o' war is not actually a jellyfish. It is a siphonophore. Unlike a jellyfish, which can survive on their own, siphonophores are a group of colonized organisms made up of cloned cells. Each group are responsible for specific tasks to keep the man o' war alive. Some cells form the float, which suspend the organism on the water's surface and create a sail to move with the wind. Others are responsible for hunting prey, and this is where we meet, the venom-filled nematocyst. These small but potent cells cover the man o' war's stinging tentacles by the thousands, and within each is a spiral-shaped barb which literally blasts out when making contact with its victim. When these barbs penetrate the skin, they release a cocktail of enzymes very similar to snake venom. These enzymes are designed to incapacitate prey, and in my case, will cause instantaneous pain. This animal is notorious for its sting. In fact, it stings thousands of people here in the state of Florida every single year. I luckily have never taken a sting until now. Time for me to take two stings from the Portuguese man o' war. In order to compare the effectiveness of the most famous remedies for being stung by a man o' war, today I'll be taking two stings side by side on the same arm. One of them to be treated with urine, the controversial yet universally accepted cure to all marine creature stings, and on the other, I will spray white vinegar, the suggested first aid from a University of Hawaii research article. Then, while enduring the venom from both stings, I will attempt to describe which of these two remedies relieves my pain the best. Two sting sites, two different antidotes, which one works the best, you're about to find out. Please do not attempt to do what I'm doing here today. Um, oh gosh, I'm so nervous I can't even get a hold of it. Okay guys, I think I got it, you ready? Ready. Okay, here we go. About to take, oh God, that looks horrible. Whew, man, I'm getting nervous. Here we go. About to take two stings from the Portuguese man of war. You guys, get your shots ready, because this is only going to happen one time. Terror of the ocean. Here we go. One, two, three. Ah! 
Yep, it's getting me. Oh yeah, I can feel it. Ah, ooh, ooh, that's like electric. Yeah, that's one. Wow, it burns right away, okay. Second sting, I gotta do this fast before that gets too bad. Ready, guys, ready? All right, one, two, second sting, three. Ah, yep. Oh, man, that one nailed me. Oh. Okay, yep. So, instant, uh, almost tingly, electrical feeling sting a lot different than a bee sting or a wasp. Oh man, those are really getting in there. I can feel it now. Now, likely there are still hundreds of nematocysts that are, oh yeah, they are erupting as I'm talking to you right now. I can feel them individually firing, like pow, 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 like a series of bullets going into my skin. Woo, yeah. Hmm, yeah. You can see it getting red on both sites now. Stink site one up here at the top. Stink site two, down here at the bottom. I can actually see remnants from the tentacles and those likely have many nematocysts in them. And it is getting worse and worse with every second. Oh man, this is bad. You do not want to get stung by a Portuguese man of war. If I were a fish right now, I'd be in big trouble. In fact, I would likely already be in complete paralysis and this man of war would be reeling me in for dinner. Okay, let the healing begin, as they say. All right, there is two steps to this. One, spray on the agent. Two, use a plastic card because you wanna scrape off as many of those nematocysts that have yet to explode as you can. First sight, vinegar. Here we go. Okay. Ooh, yeah, smells like vinegar. Now the one I'm dreading. Gross, this is... So disgusting, this is so nasty. All right, you guys are a little downwind, so you might wanna prepare to duck and cover. All right, here we go. Oh man, I don't wanna splash my face. Oh, 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 it stinks. Oh, okay, that's enough. Scraping off those active nematocysts is certainly part of the equation, so you don't wanna forget that step. I can actually see my skin pulsing. You guys can see my skin going up and down there. All the nerves in my arm right now are probably just screaming like, ah, intruder, we have venom. I feel so much better already. It feels like I'm on the road to healing. Man, it still burns though. So now it's just more of the burning. Okay, yeah, I think I'm, I'm ready to make a, a declaration of sorts at this point. Vinegar, not only more sanitary, but definitely wins the contest. This is by far the least of the two when it comes to pain. The urine site, not only is it absolutely disgusting, but it definitely burns a little worse and I could definitely feel a distinction between the two. So I'm gonna go ahead and call it. Vinegar is the definitive antidote that you want to use if you want to neutralize stinging cells on your skin. Urine, not your best friend when it comes to a jellyfish sting or a man of war sting for that matter. And there is one last step that will truly alleviate the pain symptoms that I'm feeling in my arm. Good old fashioned hot water. The reason hot water is the ultimate antidote to a man of war sting is because the heat from the water will actually denature the proteins in the venom, rendering them inert, completely harmless. And then it's just up to my body and my immune system to do the cleanup work and I'll be as good as new. Oh my gosh. Guys, this is, I've never had a hot conference feel so good. Like immediate relief. And I hope everybody watching not only enjoyed this little experiment, but learned something to take home with you. Don't use urine use vinegar to treat jellyfish stings or man of war stings. And at the end of the day, hot compress is going to be your real solution. While I did experience slight discomfort for the next few hours, the scrape and heat treatment reduced my pain to that of a mild sunburn. And by the next day, nearly all signs of redness had vanished and I was as good as new. So next time you're on the beach and you see a man of war, avoid it. But just in case you don't, some white vinegar and a hot compress seem to do the trick. So yeah, you should leave your pee in the toilet. Oh man, I am super excited. The creature that we're looking for tonight is probably one of the most bizarre animals that could be found in Australia. And we have featured some interesting things over the years on Brave Wilderness, but I can promise you nothing compares to the turtle frog. We needed rain to find this frog. 
and the rains have come, you are not going to want to miss this. Finding a turtle frog is almost impossible because you have to be in the small remote desert they live in Western Australia while it's raining. And this only happens a few times a year. Yes! Yes! Next to no footage exists of this species. If we find one, this will be the very first high quality footage ever seen. Oh, stop the car, I see something on the road. First animal of the night, a really cool lizard. Oh my gosh, it's got a huge tick on him though. I'm gonna try to pull this off. Look at that, got a tick. Oh my gosh. You see that? That is a big tick. And that is a really cool lizard. Very good sign for our search tonight. We're not exactly looking for shinglebacks, but this one was crossing the road, so we wanted to move them out of the way. You're welcome. All right, let's let you go off the road so you can continue on your way, and we'll continue on ours. This rain has the animals on the move. Like all amphibians, turtle frogs need moisture to survive and to breathe. That is why they come up to the surface after it rains. Without this rain, the frogs will remain buried beneath the ground and impossible to find. To make matters worse, turtle frogs only come to the surface at night. We're going to have to look and listen closely to even have a small chance at spotting one. All my life, I've been a frog nerd. And I've been able to track down iconic species like the red-eye tree frogs and poison dart frogs of Central America. And I've also gotten hands-on with all different kinds of toads, from giants, oh, wow, to the most colorful, got it, like this extremely rare harlequin toad. However, the turtle frog has always been my grail animal, and tonight is the first time in my career I'll have a shot at catching one. But if we're going to do that, I'll have to rely on all my years of experience and animal catching tricks to track one down. Perfect habitat for the turtle frog. See that right there? That sand substrate. Turtle frog, it burrows down up to three feet below the surface, so it really needs the sand to be able to do that. Okay, let's keep looking. We're definitely on the trail now. It's really a miracle in itself that we got prime turtle frog conditions tonight. Like seriously, all week long, the forecast called for clear skies and no rain. But tonight, out of nowhere, the rain rolled in. And I have to say, it's making this adventure feel like destiny. Oh, guys, I got something. All right, so what you're looking at there is a spiny tail gecko named for the spines on the tail, which are actually just modified scales and they're soft. They're not sharp at all. Now these geckos have a pretty unique defense mechanism where they're able to actually secrete a chemical mixture from their tails. They like whip it at the predators trying to eat them and it doesn't taste very good. The eyes of a gecko are probably some of the coolest eyes on the planet. They actually don't have eyelids, so they have to lick their eyeballs to keep them moist. Can you imagine that, licking your own eyeball? Sure glad we have eyelids. Love these geckos. Okay, we're gonna let this gecko go back in the bush and keep looking. Well, that's a good sign. We're continuing to see new creatures. Guys, guys, I got one. Look at this frog. Holy cow, that is cool. Wow. We found our first amphibian of the night. It's not the frog we're after, but that is a great sign that means that we're getting enough rain for the amphibians out here to come out of the soil. This is the Western Spotted Frog, and just like turtle frogs, they only come out just after a rainstorm. This is not the frog we're after, but it's a good start. Let's let this one go and keep searching. Perfect conditions. We just gotta keep looking. Got the rain, we're in the right spot. I've already seen one species of frog. This is like, the sweet spot, this is what we need. Got everything except the turtle frog itself. After hours of searching, we weren't seeing any signs of turtle frogs. Luckily, my experience has taught me sometimes the best way to find the frog you're looking for is with your ears. Did you guys hear that? I think I heard one. Yep. Did you guys hear that? Um, one more. Let's see if we can hear it one more time. If we hear it again, we'll try to find it. I think that's one, guys. 
Let's try to canvas this area in front of us here. Stop calling. We must be right next to him. Got him. Got a turtle frog. Holy mother. Oh my God. Look, there he is. There it is. I cannot believe we found the frog. Oh my. <laughs> oh my goodness. Hello. Come here, buddy. Oh my gosh. We have come so far to find this species. There is the turtle frog. Yeah, baby! Woo! <laughs> what are the freaking odds? Guys. Oh my gosh! I cannot believe we got one. Oh. Hello. Have you ever seen anything like that in your life? This is one of the coolest creatures I have ever laid my eyes on. Let's just appreciate this super unique creature. What you're looking at is some of the first HD footage ever recorded of a turtle frog. I mean, this species is so rare, there's very little information to find about them. But here's what we do know about this bizarre little frog. Let's start with the name, turtle frog. Named for its appearance, the most unusual frog I have ever seen, but look at its head. That dome-shaped head with the black beady little eyes and then the circular body. Looks like a turtle without a shell. This is one of the most unique looking frogs you will ever see. It looks like something out of Star Wars. Jabba the Hutt's relative. Some people say it looks like a, a little wad of chewing gum and it certainly looked like that when we first saw it. I have wanted to film, I have wanted to find one of these frogs for my entire career. This is a, a big, big moment for me. If you can't sense my excitement after this, this is about as big as it gets for a frog nerd like me. Hi, buddy. Look at that pudge. Are you kidding me? Has to be one of the most unique looking frogs, but probably the cutest frogs as well. Super pudgy, super soft. Feels like a, a water balloon almost. And when it's walking across my hand, you can really tell how much liquid is in the frog. It's like a, a deflated water balloon, but it is a very delicate frog, but it's somewhat stout. Got a lot of power in those legs. I can feel it when it's crawling across my hand. It uses its stocky arms and legs to burrow into the soil. It really is incredible how something so small and soft can dig over three feet underground. And actually here, let me get out. I'm gonna take my pack off and uh, get out a little bit of water because I don't want to dry out the frog. One of the things you always want to make sure you do when handling any amphibian is make sure you don't dry them out and this water will, will help. Oh, hey, came to life there. Hey, buddy, it's all right. Oh my goodness. Endemic to Western Australia. It can only be found here, but that's not where the oddities end. In fact, the oddities begin with this species when it's born. It's one of the few species of frogs on the planet that does not have a tadpole stage. This frog begins its life with a full set of hands and legs. What's also unique about this species is that they have one of the largest eggs of all frogs in Australia. In fact, five centimeters is as big as they grow, and this frog is approaching maximum length. Now, there's a certain period of year where at the tail end of it uh, that it's breeding and it will actually call. That's how we were able to find this frog. And it was definitely a team effort. We've got Max with us here. Uh, from Australia Wildlife Encounters. Max and I were slowly honing in on this little frog, and then I crouched down and there it was, just like you saw it right there <laughs> underneath the bush, looking right back at us with those beady little eyes. And 
It was so unlikely for us to find this frog, guys. The rains were not supposed to come, and sure enough, they appear today, almost like out of thin air, a front came in, provided enough moisture for us to have a chance to put this frog in front of the cameras. And I am so excited you guys get to see it. Now, we think this is a male because of the way it was calling. And when they're mating, they have an extended honeymoon. Once a turtle frog locates its mate, they will both burrow together for months before actually breeding and depositing their eggs. This is a, a very unique species, guys. There's not a ton of information and very few studies of this frog. So when it comes to filming animal oddities, it doesn't really get any better than this. And I am just over the moon right now that we were able to come out here our first time in Western Australia, our first time in turtle frog territory against the odds. And sure enough, we were able to find one. Oh man, I am so excited. We got to show you guys the turtle frog. What a cool frog this is. Guys, are you kidding me? Tell me in the comments section if you've seen a cooler frog than the turtle frog. I challenge anyone out there to name a more unique species of amphibian because I do not know of one. All right, let's go put this frog back and head in for the night. Man, that was awesome. We are searching these tide pools off the coast of Eastern Australia for the most toxic fish on the planet. The stonefish is notorious for having the most painful sting in all of nature. And today, I'm going to get stung by a stonefish. But first, we've got to find one. Let's get looking. It's going to be very hard to find the stonefish because in addition to their legendary sting, they are masters of hiding. The key to this is going to be to move slow, methodically, to not step on the stonefish. You could be looking right at a stonefish and not even realize it. And that's why so many people step on them by accident. But stonefish are all we have to look out for. This isn't the only animal that could do you harm here in the typhoons off of Australia. We also have cone snails and the blue ring octopus, one of the most lethal creatures in the world. And not only is it risky just being out here, but we also have to beat the clock. The tide is coming in fast, and this whole area is about to be completely underwater. So if we want to catch a stonefish, we need to do that before it happens. Everything looks exactly the same. This is gonna to be tough. Oh, right there. You see it moving? That is the stonefish. And I never would have seen that fish if it didn't give itself away by moving. Holy smokes. Now these fish are so toxic, they don't really have a flight response. I'm gonna attempt to catch the most toxic fish in the world with my bare hands. All right, here we go. Wow, there it is. That is the stonefish. Look at that tide pool monster. I can't believe we found one. I mean, it looks like a living rock. I never would have spotted this fish if it didn't move. The fact that it swam a little bit there is the only reason I was able to catch this fish. And you can see how docile this fish is. It knows just how toxic it can be. Wow. But the table is set for what will be likely the worst sting I ever take. Placing the stonefish in the tank hit my nerves hard. I'm about to get stung by a stonefish. Stonefish stings are said to be one of the most painful experiences a human can endure. And I've already experienced my fair share of fish stings. One from the most common fish sting, which is the lionfish. Ah, oh! And the other from the scorpionfish, which is the most toxic fish sting in North America. Oh, yeah, he got me. Oh. Each sting was painful, but I was certainly able to tough it out with basic treatment. However, each of those fish fall far short of the danger from the stonefish. Not every day you get to carry around the world's most toxic fish in a tank. This fish might just have the worst sting in the entire animal kingdom. Man, my nerves are firing right now. Just looking at this fish is so incredibly cool. Look at all the growths all over its body 
definitely earns its name, the stonefish, a master of camouflage. All right, let's go hands-on once again with the stonefish. The reason I can handle this fish is because it can only sting from the spines on top. Wow. This fish has developed the most potent fish toxin in the world. The toxin is only to defend itself. Unfortunately, as you can see, it is so docile that it's very easy for people to step on these fish. And that is the most common way people are stung by the stonefish. The toxin of this fish not only induces extraordinary pain, it can actually cause muscle spasms and eventual paralysis. And there have even been reported deaths from stonefish stings. But now I think it's time to see how this fish injects its venom. I'm going to just pour out this water. I'm gonna use this little tank here as a platform. This fish is perfectly fine being out of the water for extended periods of time because they've adapted the ability to actually hold water in their gills. It's not uncommon to see stonefish just laying on the rocks in these tide pools. So in the little bit of time that we have it here in front of the cameras, totally fine. All right, so I brought with me a piece of neoprene. I'm going to use this piece of neoprene to simulate skin so I can show you what would happen if you stepped on the stonefish. This animal has the ability to fire its venom into the wound created by its spine. That's why people who are envenomated and step on these stonefish end up in such a bad situation. It's not only that it's the most toxic venom, it's that you also get the most volume. Look at how sharp that spine is. Okay, in order to do this properly, I do need to get out some eye protection, so I'm gonna do that quickly. This venom, it has enough toxin in it to cause vision problems and perhaps even blindness. All right, let's see in slow motion how these spines inject venom. I'll do these top two, guys, ready? Here they go. One, two, three. Oh, wow. Look at that. And it's like blue. Holy cow, look at how much venom just came out of that fish. And let's do another one, do it one more time. Oh my gosh, guys, the spines are blue. And once those spines are out, they stay out and they're ready to defend. All right, let me try these uh, spines on the back here. One, two, three. Wow, that is what would be inside of your foot if you were to step on a stonefish. Now, it will regenerate its venom. This doesn't hurt the fish at all. And you can see these sheaths will just slide right back up. But holy cow, I gotta take a minute and process what I just saw. Oh, that is bad. I won't lie, I'm getting pretty nervous right now. This is something you should never do. I've consulted experts, people who have been stung. I've done my research, I've done my homework, but even still, I am extremely nervous about what is about to happen. It's said that this is the most painful sting in the world. <sighs> Wish me luck. The moment has come. It's time to be stung by the world's most toxic fish. I am borderline terrified. I've thought long and hard about whether or not to even go through with this, but I'm doing this today because through my research on the stonefish, I have found a lot of misinformation out there. There is a lot of stories that pretty much describe certain death if you're stung by a stonefish, and that's just simply not the case. While this toxin in the base of its spines is extremely potent, it is thermal liable. So if treated properly and if needed with medical attention, you will survive the sting of a stonefish. Most of the victims that end up dying from stonefish stings, but has more to do with the pain and shock that leads to cardiac arrest. This venom is meant to cause you pain, but I have brought the antidote with me today. A thermos filled with hot water that's around 114 degrees Fahrenheit, a compress to hold over the wound, and then of course, if I do go into any state of anaphylactic shock, I always carry with me an EpiPen. We are about three minutes drive from an emergency room. So even if the worst case scenario does unfold today, I should have plenty of time to be able to get to emergency medical attention. All right, my plan today is to take a micro dose of stonefish venom. 
the venom from that neoprene trial is already coating the spikes. So they are locked and loaded, ready to go. When it's all said and done, this should be just extraordinarily painful for me and hopefully very educational for you. This is going to likely be the worst sting that I ever take. I'm Mark Vins and I'm about to enter the sting zone with the stonefish, the most toxic fish in the world. All right, I'm gonna go with this front spine here. Ready? This spine. On three. One. Two. Three. Ah! Mmm. Yep. Mmm. I already feel burned. I could feel it spreading up my finger right now. And it does not feel good. Wow, the tide is coming in. All right, here, let's. Mm, hang on. Mm, let's move out of here. The tide's rolling in. You okay, Mark? Yeah, hang on. I'm gonna come over here. Andrew, put the fish back in the tank, man. Mm. Oh. Right there is where, where the spine went in. God. Immediate fire spreading up my fingers. I can already feel it in these, these three. Mmm. Can you help Mark? Are you okay? No, I'm okay. I'm okay right now. It's like a different magnitude of pain. It is like throbby, achy. Mm, hang on, I gotta walk it off. Yeah. I'm gonna try to tough it out for a little bit. I wanna see how far the venom spreads before I start applying the first aid. This is borderline unbearable. Mm. Oh my gosh. Mm. Let me know when you need the water, Mark. I'm just like, it's making me nervous. Mm. Oh my gosh. Yeah, definitely drew a little bit of blood. Oh, and it is hot. It's like closing my hand is becoming hard. Mm. Ah, yeah, it's spreading. It's like all up the back of my hand now. Mm. Mm. I think I need to go for the hot water, guys. I don't want this to spread anymore. I'm going to the hot water. Mm. There we go. Stonefish is good. Now I need to fix myself. So this hot water will actually stop the venom from working and should help my pain. Mm. Every bit as painful as advertised. I never want to do that again. And I need to get more hot water on this sting. And hopefully the pain subsides, but it's still increasing for me. Tingling pain continued to build and spread up through my shoulder all the way to my neck. Even a month after the sting, I still have numbness and tingles in my fingers. The immediate pain wasn't enough to send me to the hospital, but as we released the stonefish, I could imagine what would happen if a full load of its venom were to go on my foot. That instance would send you directly to the hospital. And if you're ever stung, please, you should seek medical attention as soon as possible. Needless to say, the stonefish certainly lives up to the legend of being the most painful fish on the planet. I'm starting my search for Arizona's largest tarantula, and normally I do my best to not get bitten by giant hairy spiders, but today I'm going to intentionally take a bite from the desert blonde tarantula to see just how dangerous it really is. But before I can do that, I've got to catch one. Let's get searching. We're searching the Sonoran Desert of Arizona to find these tarantulas. This desert is teeming with all sorts of venomous creatures, and the best time to find them is after dark. The sun is finally set, headlamp, is on. This headlamp is going to be the main tool that I use tonight to find one of these tarantulas. So I'm gonna use my headlamp to sweep from side to side. There's not a lot that gives away other than just getting a light right on the tarantula itself. And then comes the tricky part, actually catching one. I also have a snake hook with me tonight, which could come in handy in catching a tarantula. But the main reason I have it is because this is prime rattlesnake territory. There's a lot more things crawling around out here than just big spiders. These spiders are out tonight hunting, but if they're near their hole, they'll quickly tuck back in. If I don't get close enough in time, it's pretty much game over and we'll have to find a new tarantula to catch. Whoa, we got a rattlesnake right there. You see it coiled up? Right there. Back up a little bit, guys. That is a Western Diamondback rattlesnake. Now, it is not a big one. This is a juvenile, but it is still capable of inflicting a very serious bite. You can use a snake hook to move snakes out of our way, just like this. 
Let the snake go. And we keep searching for spiders. Yes. It's a great sign that we're seeing all these venomous creatures out on the hunt. This desert is coming alive. Put a scorpion right at your foot. Look at this. Desert hairy scorpion right there. Let's see if I can grab it. Best way to do this is just to grab right at the top knuckle so it can't sting me. Let's see if we can get him to calm down. Stay, stay buddy, stay buddy. Come on. There we go, that's good. Oh. Got him. Oh yeah, he's pinching me. All right, here we go. Let's see, show you what we got here. That is a pretty good size giant desert hairy scorpion. The largest species of scorpion in the United States. Luckily, I've got a good grip on its stinger there, but you can see there's even a little bit of venom starting to come out of the tip of it. If you don't grab these guys correctly, they will give you a pretty good pop. You can see why they call them the desert hairy. Look at all the hairs all over its body. It doesn't get much cooler than these large scorpions. All right, let's put them back and keep looking for those tarantulas. Scorpions and tarantulas are out here hunting the same food. I have a feeling we're closing in on our giant spider. Oh, I got a spider right there. Let's go. All right, I got my container. Let's see if we can get a catch. Okay, it's holes right here. I'm going to need to move in carefully. That is a big male. Oh no, I lost it. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Maybe I can coax it back out. Oh, no. Ah, lost it. Wait, hang on. It's still there. I got it back. I got it back. Snake hook is coming in clutch. Okay, coax in this direction. See it rearing its abdomen up. Okay, oh, just bit the snake hook. Here we go, guys. Got it, got it. Here we go. Woo! Oh, buddy, that is a good one. Big male. Desert blonde tarantula. After a little bit of searching and a little bit of luck that we brought the snake hook, we got ourselves our tarantula for the bite test. All right, I'll take you back in. Let's go, guys. Yes! As fate would have it, as we were heading back to start setting up for the bite test, we saw an even bigger spider. Oh, another tarantula. This one looks bigger. Oh, yeah, okay. Let's try to catch this one, too. All right, I don't know how close it is to its hole, but I'm gonna go in for the catch. Here we go. Holy cow, that is a huge freaking spider, guys. Wow. Ho, 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 ho! Ho, That is the specimen we have been after. That is a truly huge tarantula. I did not expect this. Not one, but two huge desert blonde tarantulas. What we have here are a male and a female. And unfortunately for me, I think this video just turned from a tarantula bite test to a tarantula bite comparison. And I'm sure you are as curious as I am which of these two spiders has the more painful bite. It's time to find out. I am definitely nervous. Oh man. Oh, oh my goodness. Two full-grown desert blonde tarantulas, and the table is now set for the ultimate spider bite test here in the Sonora Desert. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. What I'm about to do is a bad idea. Please do not attempt to recreate what you're about to see in this video. We have two tarantulas here in front of us. We have a male and the female, which we found unexpectedly. I think it is worth doing a bite test comparison to see which bite is more ferocious because these spiders live very different lives from each other. Females actually live for a lot longer. We're talking 25 years for a female tarantula and only five to 10 years for a male. Females tend to bunker down. They stay a lot more localized to their nests where the males are much more nomadic and predatory. I have a suspicion that we have a very different bite profile to these two spiders, and we are going to put that to the ultimate test. Let's take a closer look at Arizona's largest spider. Ladies first. In order to get some really good footage of the spider, I'm going to move it into this glass dome. And of course, we don't want our spider to get away. All right, 
delicate little procedure here. Wow. There we go. Perfect. Perfect. Perfect transfer. Oh my goodness. The fangs on these spiders are enormous. It's not just going to be the venom that I'm up against today. We're talking actual puncture wounds from fangs that large. In terms of what they're out here hunting and eating, pretty much anything that they can grapple onto. They are very strong spiders. And of course, possessing those large fangs, they could subdue a variety of prey, even small lizards would be a good meal for a spider this size. The females tend to be a little bit bigger than the males. They are called a desert blonde tarantula, predominantly because you can see those hairs and just how blonde they are in the middle. But that is a full grown desert blonde tarantula. The best way to probably go about doing this is for me to grab it by its carapace, the top of the head of the spider, and I'm gonna try to pin it, grab it, and then I'll be able to show you the fangs and of course, inflict the bite right here on my thumb. Whew. All right, um, brought a couple things with me today. I have a large pair of tweezers. Of course, we always bring first aid kit. The thing I need the most is the EpiPen. The worst outcome that can happen besides the pain that I'm about to experience is an allergic reaction. I think it's time to take the first of two bites from a tarantula. Okay, here we go. Now the females are known for being a little more docile than the males. Beyond, oh, easy girl, easy girl. Back, back, back. So you see how it's rearing its abdomen up right there? Beyond their capability to inflict bites, they also possess another defense mechanism, which is to flick the hairs off their abdomen. Females are rumored to be less aggressive, but this one looks ready to bite. And what I'm trying to do right now is to get a good hold on the carapace. This is the safest way for me to hold it for both me and the tarantula. There we go. Oh, jeez. Okay. That was, that, that made my heart jump. Okay. The spider just wants to come right at me. Oh my gosh. Did you hear that? That is the sound of spider fangs scraping the table. Okay. Look at the size of those fangs. And their fangs are retractable, just like a snake. And they are thick. We're talking some very large fangs. Those are going to pop holes in my skin for sure. <sighs> gotta get up a lot of nerve to do this. Okay, I've got a good grip on the spider. I'm gonna go for it on three. I'm Mark Vins, and I'm about to take a bite from Arizona's largest spider, the desert blonde tarantula. On three. One. So nervous. Two. Three. Spider's fangs are on my skin. Ah! Yep, got me. You can see there's a little blood right there. Only popped one fang through. I don't think I gotta take a better bite, guys. It wasn't a good enough bite. All right, I'm gonna do one more. Ready? On three. One, two, three. Ah! Yeah, that, that time it got me. That time it got me good. Oh my God. That freaked me out. Oh my gosh. Okay. Hang on, let me get the spider back. Get back in there, girl. Get back in there. Ah. Uh, yeah, see right there. See that? <sighs> Definitely burns. Oh my gosh, my adrenaline is like firing right now, guys. I, I feel like my soul uh. just jumped out of my body. That is the freak, most freaked out I've been around an animal. Uh. And it definitely burns. Oh man. My neck, okay? yeah. My neck is like seized up. It's like I've got a cramp right here. I don't know if it's from the bite or if it's from just the nerves and the tension. Oh my gosh. I think it's nerves. I, I don't think it's from the venom. <sighs> definitely burns. 
it's a uh, it's definitely a burning sensation i had to really try hard to get that spider to bite me i want to point that out that this this spider did not want to bite but that was not an aggression bite for sure okay i think i'm i'm good enough to do another bite i think it's time to bring in the second tarantula and see if the male can inflict a more aggressive bite wound, which I have a feeling that's gonna happen. Males are known to be more aggressive, and that's why I wanted to do a bite test here. Much darker in coloration than the female, too. Not looking forward to this. And my hand still burns from that first bite. Okay, come here. Come here, you. Come here, you. Okay. Got a pin. Oh my gosh. Way stronger way stronger, way more aggressive. Look at it attacking. Got it. Oh boy, that was tough. Okay, there you have it. The male desert blonde tarantula. Here are the fangs. You can see just as terrifying as the female spider. You can see there's even venom on these. Okay, on three. I'm about to take my second bite, this time from a male and much more aggressive desert blonde tarantula. On three. One, two, three. I'm just waiting for the bite to come. You see, he does not want to bite me. It's not as angry as the female. No. Big reaction is that these, these animals do not want to bite me. So while we've given this spider plenty of opportunity to inflict a bite, you can see it really has no intent to do me any harm. And frankly, it should be a lot more afraid of me than I am of it. So I hope after watching this video, we all have learned some important lessons about Arizona's largest spider. Even though these spiders are large and admittedly pretty creepy, we really have no reason to fear them. And honestly, their venom isn't that strong because spiders this large tend to use their strength to overtake their prey. They don't wanna bite you, and even if they do, it's really not that bad. All right, let's let our spiders back off into the desert. Today we are on the hunt for the batfish, one of the most bizarre creatures in the ocean. This fish is so strange, you'll hardly believe it's a fish at all. To find one, we will dive under Florida's famous Blue Heron Bridge and search through piles of wreckage. This fish is going to be hiding from us, so spotting one will be a challenge. On top of that, our time is extremely limited. We only have around 50 minutes of air in the tank, and we need to complete the mission before the strong currents return with the tide and make diving here impossible. There's no time to waste. Let's get searching. To find the batfish, we will need to get close to the bottom and search carefully. They are masters of disguise and are usually hidden so well you can easily miss them even if you're looking directly at it. Do you see all of those spiky red worms? Those are painful to touch and are called fireworms. Fireworms are a real danger for any diver. Their needle-like spines are covered in a strong toxin that can sting and cause horrible pain. Underwater, it's an even bigger risk because the pain can cause panic attacks and difficulty breathing. If I were to get stung right now, it could be an emergency situation. Clearly, they are everywhere, so touching anything without looking first is a terrible idea. Okay, that looks like a good place for a batfish to hide. Let's search over there. And I can already feel the current starting to come back, making it harder to swim forward. Because of the tides, there are only two small windows of time every day to even try to search for batfish. But because finding one is so rare, they are always the number one target of anyone who dives here. Look, there's something hiding under that rock. It's a spotted moray eel. While most non-divers worry about sharks, Actually, it's these animals that are far more common and likely to attack. All right, let's give this guy some space and keep searching for the batfish.
Oh, check this out. That is an arrowhead crab. They are super strange and worth a closer look. At first glance, you might mistake the crab for a spider from outer space, but they are actually related to normal crabs. If we zoom in, we can see there, there are two blue pinchers near the front of its body. Oh, and look, there's a yellow spotted stingray. These rays can be extremely hard to spot because they are small and spend most of their lives buried beneath the sand. Like other stingrays, they have a razor-sharp barb along their tail and will sting if threatened. And just because we can see one doesn't mean there aren't others hiding around. Stingrays could be hidden anywhere down here and is yet another reason we need to be careful anytime we touch the sand. Okay, that's a quarter tank gone. But I feel like our luck is starting to pick up. Spotting all these other creatures is a great sign the batfish could be close by. Oh, take a look at this spike ball. Sometimes they're confused for puffer fish because these burrfish are very similar looking. Yes, those spikes are super sharp and is why they don't have many predators down here. Even for the toughest fish, you don't want a mouthful of spines like that. The tide is coming back faster than I thought it would. And it's really hard to hold the camera steady. But I'm seeing something bright. Let's close in on those pillars. Oh wow, that is a giant yellow seahorse and a super rare find. I didn't even know we could find these here. If you look carefully, you can see it's covered in small black dots. And to handle these strong currents, seahorses use their tails to anchor on nearly anything they can grab onto since they aren't very good swimmers. But that has to be the most colorful seahorse I've ever seen. Very cool, but we need to move on. Visibility is starting to get worse and time is really running out. There's definitely a lot of life down here, but still no signs of the batfish. Air supply is just above 40%. We really need to hurry up. Okay, this is the perfect habitat. Let's search this area well. Batfish are masters of camouflage. Still seeing fireworms everywhere. Just can't get away from them. All right, no luck in that pile. These sandy bottoms are probably our best bet with the remaining air. While it is common to find them tucked in debris, you can also see batfish in areas like this. Seen something up near that wreck. Definitely some activity in the debris around it. Jeez, this wreck is absolutely covered in fireworks too. But what do we have here? Oh, that is a pair of spiny lobsters in a big sea urchin behind them. And right next to them is another arrowhead crab. Still no batfish. All right, it's time to get back on track. We have about 20 minutes left before I run out of air. The search is not over. Seen something now lurking behind that piece of rubble there. See it four meters away? Let's check it out. It's a sea robin, another bottom dwelling fish that can actually walk. Truthfully, this is about as close as you can get to a batfish without actually being one. We need to be careful here. I don't want to scare it away too soon. Sea robins are fast when they want to be. Approaching now. Okay, this one is a northern sea robin and is right next to a bandtail puffer. He is watching me. All right, so their most unusual feature has to be their ability to walk on those spines, which are nothing more than modified fins, but they definitely look like legs. This fish could have easily been named the spider fish. And as you can see, they use their legs really well to walk around so they can scavenge for food. Okay, he's thinking of fleeing now, and this is a good time to see the display of those wing-like fins. And there he goes, flying across the seafloor. 
When they deploy their fins, it allows them to move quickly for short periods, and they can glide along the seafloor, almost like the wings of a bird. Let's give this guy some space. We are still on the hunt for the batfish, and we're not giving up yet. All right, I'm seeing something there. Bingo, target spotted. That is a batfish, zoom in. All right, approaching. Let's see how close we can get. This is a polka dot batfish, a slow swimmer that can also walk along the seafloor using its two stubby fins as feet. I'm going to try to get even closer to show you how it blends in with its surroundings. They usually remain still to look like debris on the seafloor, which helps them ambush their prey when it swims too close. In this case, it's helping us get a lot closer with the camera. Whoa, here he comes, making a fast break. Let's try to follow and hopefully he'll stop again. This might be my only shot to see one of these. Okay. Now for something really weird. I'm going to attempt to show off its gills, which are actually located behind its armpits. This might be a little tricky. There they are. The batfish gills are oddly located behind their fins, which helps them remain still and camouflage. I have just about 15% air remaining and every breath counts especially when you found one of the rarest animals down here and have more to see. You can really get a good look at its strange shape from this overhead shot. Check out that triangle body. Okay, here we go, nice and calm now. Game on, let's try to look for the most famous attribute of the batfish, their lure. Since they're a member of the anglerfish family, they are equipped with a built-in fishing rod just above their mouth that retracts in and out. Yes, it actually is a fishing pole that moves out of their face, much like a transformer. They use this lure to attract small fish and other animals that they can gobble up. I won't be able to hang on much longer until we have to surface. Come on, one time. There it is. Did you see that? Let's play that back. What? It actually has a lure on the end of the rod that it flings out as well. I didn't even know that it could do that. Holy cow. I cannot believe how much it can transform its face like that. That is absolutely amazing and cooler than I could have ever imagined. All right, batfish footage secured and mission accomplished. We are in the outback of Western Australia looking for a truly bizarre creature and it's covered in razor sharp spines. Let's just say catching this one, it's gonna hurt a little. This creature is just as shy as it is sharp. So first we have to track one down in this huge forest, which also happens to be home to another one of the rarest and most endangered animals on the planet that we're also trying to find by the end of this video. But in order to catch this giant spike ball, we're going to need to look for clues. Oh yeah, right there, check that out. This is a termite nest. This will be a perfect feast for the creature that we're after today. That tells me we are on the right track. Let's keep searching. Our second clue is that these creatures love to hide near trees and stumps. So that's where we're spending the most time looking. The problem is this forest is full of hiding places. This is like looking for a needle or a big pile of needles in a giant haystack. After hours of searching, we got lucky with the discovery of a final clue. That is a good sign right there. That's some poop from the creature we're after. You can see all the ants and termites in here. That means we're getting close. Oh, right there. That's an echidna. Look at that. Ho oh, ho! Yes! That is what we have been looking for all morning long. That 
is Australia's spikiest creature, the echidna. And it is, yeah, wow, that is sharp. Okay, the echidna from the top is a tank riddled with spikes and a super tough skin. But underneath the echidna is a soft belly. And I'm gonna try to work my hand underneath this animal so I can present it to you. This is probably going to be a challenge. Let's see if I get my hand underneath. Ready? Ah, come here, buddy. It's okay. And he's just wriggling in there. Ah! Oh, he's spiking. Ah, he's getting me. Mm. Now, unlike a porcupine, their spines can't release, but they are super sharp nonetheless. Ow! Okay. Okay, he's really wedged in there, guys. This is gonna be tough. Ah! Mm. Yeah, I'm getting nailed. All right, I'm gonna have to use some gloves here. There's no way I'm gonna be able to pry out this echidna. It is basically cuffing up its body, using its spikes to wedge itself into this stump of the tree. All right, here we go. Luckily, I always carry a good pair of gloves with me on every adventure. I wanna to get to the underside of the echidna that is much softer, and that should allow me to hold it for the scene. But I'm gonna have to do this really carefully. I'm trying to like work under all of the different spines. There we go. Uh-huh. Okay. Now, these spines are nothing more than modified hair, so this isn't hurting the echidna at all. It's only hurting me. Ah! Oh, you're sharp. Ow! Poked right through the club. Okay, I've got, I've got the underside. I've got the underside. This is good. Okay. I think I feel his foot. Ow! Oh, gosh, you are really... Ah! I'm getting spine so bad. Okay. All right, I'm underneath him. I'm underneath him. This is good. Under, the underbelly is so much easier to contend with. All right, right. Got him. Got him. I've got the echidna. We got one, guys. That is the echidna. Hello. All right, let's go this way. I see an opening over here. This will be perfect. So I think for the echidna to be most comfortable, it's going to mean a little discomfort for me. I'm going to attempt to take my gloves off to do this scene, not only in hopes that the echidna will be more comfortable and will show us that beak, but also as to show everyone why you should never pick up an echidna. Oh boy. Hello. <laughs> this animal likes to hide by wedging against the nearest object. In this case, it's my foot. Gotta get to the soft belly part. <laughs> oh, so sharp. Ah, come here. Come here. <gasps> Every time I try to pick him up, his spikes break under the skin of my fingernails. <laughs> Come on, Knuckles. Anybody who is a fan of the Sonic the Hedgehog video game definitely knows Knuckles the Echidna. And you are tough as nails, Knuckles. Yeah. Hey, buddy, I'm gonna put you on my knee, if that's okay. It's going through my pants. Ah, ah, Knuckles. Oh my gosh, it's so sharp. Okay, hi. You are the spikiest creature I have ever held with my bare hands. Oh my goodness. Okay, this animal from the top side is almost bulletproof from any predator. Not only does it have these sharp spines, but the top hide is very tough. Now on the underside of the echidna, on the underside of the echidna, there's very soft underbelly along with its face. Hopefully, this echidna will get comfortable enough with me today to show its little face because it is super adorable. I'm trying to make it as comfortable as I can. Ah, as discomforting as it is for me, I wanna show you that adorable little beak, the face of the echidna. Come on, buddy. I'm just gonna hold it here and try to be silent. And try to be silent! Ah, oh my gosh. Ah, he's poking his nose at me. Come on, come on, say hi. Oh, I think we're gonna have an appearance of the kidna beak. Hi. Hello. Come say hi. Oh, I can see the eyeball. Come say hi. Ah! No, 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 that's a no. Door slammed. There we go. Give a shot. 
Shows your cute little mug. <sighs> Trying to be quiet, fight through the pain, because I want you to see the face of the echidna. Come out, come out and show us. Show us the face. <laughs> You see it? Mm. 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 Oh, there's a snail. Mm. Mm. Guys, get the shot. Get the shot. Hi. How are you? I'm not doing good. I hope you're doing well, though. All right, guys. That is the beak of the echidna. And it has been very painful to get on camera. Ah, you little. You little, you little spike ball. Ah. Ah. Okay, okay. So you can see the boogery nose there. These animals just recently were discovered to be able to regulate their body heat by blowing snot bubbles on their nose. Oh man. Okay. Just gotta work through the pain a little bit. So an echidna, feast on a diet made up completely of ants and termites. In fact, this animal also has some of the best hearing of any animal in Australia, and it's so sophisticated, they can actually hear the termites and the ants crawling underground, which is why we have to be so quiet. Ah, it's so sharp. It is so sharp. And now, compared to the hedgehog, an echidna weighs a lot more. I would say this echidna is in excess of 10 pounds. And just the weight alone. Oh. Makes it super sharp and its spines. Ah, its spines are so sharp, guys. Okay. Ah. Now, if you get a shot of that foot, you'll notice that it's actually backwards. That is a very unusual trait. A lot of times when people are tracking echidnas, they will actually follow them the opposite direction because of the fact that those hind feet are flipped in the opposite direction. These animals have long claws on the back of their feet that are primed for digging, and the echidna has the ability to dig in. And a lot of times when you see these in the environment, they are literally just a ball of spikes. In fact, the only predator that really targets the echidna here in Australia is the feral invasive fox. They'll actually pee on the back of these animals and get them to flip over to expose that soft underbelly from the top, the echidna is almost bulletproof. From underneath, they're a little teddy bear. And that's why it curls up into a ball, just like this. All right. Look at that face. Ow! You hurt me. You hurt me so. Ugh. Okay, okay, put him down. Put him down. Ah. 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 Definitely drew some blood. That is like wildlife acupuncture. I do not recommend it. It's time to put our echidna back where we found it. And honestly, I'm not sure who's happier about this. Me or the echidna. My hands are on fire right now. Ouch. With the echidna safely back in its tree and my hands throbbing in pain, it's now time to track down one of the rarest animals on the planet, the numbat, one of the last living relatives of the now extinct Tasmanian tiger. Most of the remaining numbats in the world live in Dryandra National Park, but Dryandra is completely surrounded by farmland, trapping the numbats inside. This forest is really the last place we can find them. Spotting one is going to be really challenging because they blend into the landscape perfectly. Luckily, just like the echidna, numbats feed on termites, so we know we're on the right trail. We searched the forest really hard for over six hours without a sign of anything. It was a ghost town, but just when I was thinking about giving up for the day, I noticed something furry running through the bushes. Oh my gosh, that's him. Oh my God. There he is. I found one. I got him. I'm filming the numbat. He's looking right at me. Oh, I can't believe it. Wow. This is one of the last numbats on the planet. Numbats are a critically endangered species with less than 1,000 left in the wild. Places like Dryandra National Park in Australia are so important in protecting species like this from going extinct. And that's why it's important that this forest remains standing. This has to be one of the rarest animals I've ever filmed. 
What's he, what's he doing now? What's he doing? No, is he trying to crawl inside? No way, never gonna fit. Ha, look at his little legs go. He can barely fit, is he gonna make it? Oh, oh, <laughs> and there he goes. Gosh, that was awesome. Oh, don't wanna take a sting yet. Ah. Here, I got a corner him, I got a corner him. Here we go. All right, here we go, ready? I got him, you guys see a shot? Got it. One, two, three. Oh, yeah. Ah, yeah, they can pinch, they can pinch really good. Ah, he's pinching me. When they pinch you, your first instinct is to let go of that tail. And that's exactly what the scorpion wants. So it can wield that stinger and inflict a painful punch. Oh, but you just gotta fight through it. Eventually he'll relax and realize he's been caught. But look at the size of that scorpion. That is one serious arachnid. Let's see just how painful the giant hairy scorpion really is. Oh boy, would you take a look at that. Look at the size of that scorpion. And it is time for another sting test this time with America's largest scorpion, the giant Desert Harry. Now we found the scorpion just feet away, right here at our Airbnb in Tucson, Arizona. In fact, check this out. We have a, we have a live studio audience today. Try to keep it down, guys. The giant Desert Harry scorpion earns its name because it is truly giant. Most scorpions out here are a fraction of the size of this one. This is a truly huge arachnid with a stinger that is also giant. And this is a species that you would come across if you lived in Arizona or you're out here adventuring. This is certainly an animal that can end up inside your house. I wanna take a sting today to show you just how severe the sting from this scorpion truly is. And then we will know once and for all whether or not we need to be afraid of this hairy arachnid. We're also going to rank this sting on three factors, intimidation, pain, and aftermath, scoring each from one to 10, and then we will average the total to see where this scorpion rates on the brand new and official Brave Wilderness Bite Sting Index. Boy, it is fired up and aggressive already. Holy cow, look at those pinchers. This scorpion is big enough to actually give you a sizable pinch, so when I first pick it up today, I'm gonna get walloped right off the bat. Now, before I get stung, let's talk about some of the things I brought with me for the test today. I brought with me some sting kill, but I have never used sting kill on any of my sting tests before. So I thought, hey, it's in my pack. Let's give it a shot with today's scorpion sting to see if this sting antidote actually relieves the pain from a scorpion. And then of course, I always bring with me my first aid kit along with my EpiPen. Just in case I have some sort of severe allergic reaction to this venom, the EpiPen will save me in time to get to emergency services. So I always carry an EpiPen. Never attempt to do what I'm about to do. This is not a good idea. Yes, I think this is going to hurt very badly. Please do not attempt to do what you're about to see. I am definitely nervous. I am always nervous before I take a sting from a species for the first time because until you take the venom firsthand, you never really know how bad it's going to be. So with that, I think it's time to get hands on and release the beast. You guys ready? Got the shot? Okay. Careful. Whoa. Now I have to grab the scorpion without taking the sting. Man, it's fast. I'm gonna use this platform to help keep it on the table. All right, so the object here is to not get stung before I'm ready, but in order to tail the scorpion, I need to grab a segment right behind the telson, which is the stinger. And this is a one-shot deal. If you do this wrong, you are getting stung almost instantly. All right, ready? One, two, three. Got him. And then he's gonna try to pinch me with those big pinchers. Nice! Yeah, he's got his pincher on me there, oh, right under my skin. Now, I have a good grip, and we can talk about how the scorpion feels. Its exoskeleton is very rigid and hard, almost as hard and tough 
is a crab or a lobster. So I am by no means gonna squish or hurt the scorpion by holding it like this. And yes, those pinchers can give you a wallop of a pinch. Ah, yeah. Mm, one more time for good measure. Now, another kind of interesting thing is the face of the scorpion. You can see it has some eyes right here at the sides and it has eyes right there in the center, similar to a spider. It gets its name, the giant desert hairy, not only because it's giant in size, but because it's also hairy. You can see the hairs off of all the appendages and you can really see the hairs coming off the tip of the stinger there, you see that? And those hairs help the scorpion sense its environment. This is an arachnid having eight legs related to spiders, but of course it has a much different defense mechanism than a spider. Spiders use fangs to inject venom. Scorpions inject venom with the stinger on their tail. Okay, I think it's time to talk about the business end of the scorpion. The sting of the giant desert hairy is delivered by the tip of the stinger, the telson, which has a venom gland within it that delivers its venom like a hypodermic needle. And this animal uses its sting as a means of defense and predation. This scorpion will be out hunting at night. Once it finds a prey item, which would be other small insects, arachnids, or even a small lizard, it would grapple it with those large pinchers and then inflict a painful sting, subduing its prey so they could be eaten alive. But in this sting test, it will be using its stinger as a defense mechanism against my hand, just like any would-be predator. Okay, it's time to go hand to stinger with America's largest species of scorpion. You guys ready? So here's what we're gonna do. I'm going to cover the scorpion with my hand, my left hand, and I'm going to release the stinger. When I do that, this scorpion is going to instantly go into defense mode and rapidly sting me with that tail. And I can tell you right now, this scorpion is fired up. It is ready to go. It's pinched me multiple times and it means business. You guys ready for this? I'm looking at the tip of that stinger right now. On three. One, two, three. Ah, ah, he's pitching me. Ah, yep. Ah, oh, oh my God, the venom sprayed. Did you see that? Oh, ah, ah. Oh, it's stuck there. Oh. Ah. Oh, I had to pull the stinger out, it was stuck under my skin, and I got sprayed by venom. Did you guys see that pool of venom? Oh my gosh. Oh. All right, here, I gotta put this, I gotta put this back. Oh. Oh. oh yeah, that was a full burst. Oh, I definitely got dosed, and it burns. You see it's already starting to get red around my knuckle. Mm, it's starting to burn really bad. Hang on. Oh yeah. I cannot believe how much venom just sprayed out of the tail like that. I didn't know it could spray and it does burn. Holy smokes. Yeah, this whole area is a little inferno right there all around my knuckles. Man, mm, that is so much different than I expected it to be. I expected the stinger to just pop, like whap me. It like scooped up underneath my skin and I had to literally pull the stinger out. Oh man, that burns. Yeah, that burns real good. Okay. It's been about five minutes and you can see that I'm definitely getting some swelling going. Uh, we're gonna continue to monitor this sting, but now it's time to officially rank this sting. For an intimidation factor, seeing that huge tail jab me over and over and all that venom spraying out was super intimidating. So I give it an eight out of 10. The pain was somewhere between a hornet and a bee sting, I'd rate it a four out of 10. For the aftermath, it wasn't so bad. The pain afterwards is very manageable, especially after applying some sting kill. So I give it only a three out of 10. Combined, this scorpion rates at a 4.3 on the brand new official Brave Wilderness Bite Sting Index. That is, that is easily the gnarliest sting I have ever taken in terms of seeing the stinger go in and get stuck. I've never had to pull a stinger out like that before. That was wild. But in terms of should we be afraid of this animal, I don't think we should be any more afraid of the giant desert hairy scorpion than we are of your common bee or wasp.
Deep in the heart of the Caribbean Sea, on one of its many craggy islands, lives a lizard that has been brought back from the brink of extinction and now roams this tropical landscape by the hundreds. That island is Grand Cayman, and that lizard is none other than the blue iguana. And while an iguana might not immediately strike you as being unique or noteworthy, I assure you this one absolutely is because it's blue, very blue, making it one of the most beautiful and rarest iguanas on the planet. Now to put things in perspective, these lizards dwindled all the way down to an estimated 15 total individuals in the wild, making them functionally extinct. Which is where our friend Fred Burton steps in. Directly responsible for creating the Blue Iguana Recovery Program, Fred has offered us the unique opportunity to get up close with these endangered reptiles and toward the facility he started 15 years ago. Right now, what we're doing is we're trying to find one of the resident blue iguanas that's habituated to humans. His name is Peter, and apparently he's big and friendly and a great ambassador for his species. So we're trying to get close to Peter, try to get the GoPro up close, try to get the cameras up close so you can see why this is such a unique lizard species. So Peter's on his favorite rock. Oh, is this Peter here? Look at him, yes. Now that is an impressive iguana. All right, guys, let's uh, come in Peter's enclosure here. Wow, look at that. Let's get a shot of Peter before we approach, just in case he wants to hop off that rock, because that is a great display of a blue iguana right there. Yeah, this is a unique species. It's only found in Grand Cayman. Okay, yeah. so the blue iguana is endemic to the Cayman Islands, and it is a species of rock iguana. We've seen rock iguanas in the past, but I have never seen one this color. I mean, and you're telling me that these blue iguanas get even more blue than this. When they're in the breeding season, yeah. He's kind yeah. of dull right now. Really? Um, when he gets hot wow, and excited. Dull. I think you look great. And in March and April, when he's courting the girls, mm -hmm. he's, he, he will blaze blue. Um, really, really, really bright. Hi, Peter. Are we buddies? Are we gonna be pals? I think so. So Fred, tell us a little bit about Peter. How did he come to the uh, program and why is he so friendly? He's an interesting case because we were just walking around out in the open there a good many years ago and we saw a young two-year-old just on the gravel and we thought, where did he come from? Figured it must have been one of the free-roaming iguanas had laid and hatched and whatnot. But we start thinking, okay, we better catch it so we can get a blood sample and do the genetics and all this thing. So we're creeping up to this thing and it's just looking at us. It's not afraid, yeah. you know, and we just walk up to this iguana and pick him up and he doesn't run away. And he's been like that ever since. He's, he, he, it's like he was born without the fear gene. You know, he wow. just, he doesn't, he has no natural reaction to Friendly humans. since day one. I like it. So Peter's turning more blue because he's warming up to us. Is that what this is? He likes the attention, yeah. All right. Well, who doesn't like a good head scratch? So quick little uh, disclaimer to everybody at home. Don't go up to a wild iguana and pet it. This is uh, not uh, a normal iguana. This Definitely. is an iguana that has been habituated to humans and is used to this kind of interaction and is why we are able to get so close to Peter today. If you try to do this to a wild rock iguana, you're gonna get bit. And if you look here at Peter's mandibles, they have quite the powerful bite and they also have a couple rows of razor sharp teeth. So you definitely do not want to get your finger or your hand caught in the jaws of a wild rock iguana. So best to leave them alone and give them their safe distance. But man, are they cool. So these, um, these beads, we put on every iguana we release. And we also put them on the captive iguanas in case they get out. Mm. And the idea is the combination of bead sizes and bead colors is unique to each animal. So that, uh, you know, if we're walking around the park and we see an iguana and we want to know who that is, all we need to do is train binoculars on the beads, look them up in the database, and we'll know exactly who we're dealing with. But the other thing we do... I think do, Peter's sleeping. The other thing <laughs> we do is we photograph the sides and the top of his head. Mm -hmm. And these big and large scales, if you look at the scales on his snout here, they're all a little bit irregular. Right, they don't, they're not perfectly symmetrical. Okay, yeah, yeah, and yeah. And every iguana has a slightly different scale pattern it's like a fingerprint so we got pictures of this guy and if this guy turned up somewhere he didn't want to be and the pit tag was gone and the bead tag was gone we'd still be able to match the photograph and say that is that iguana that is peter that is peter but just 
judge on how we're able to approach Peter, I don't think it would take very long to figure out who it was. <laughs> so one of the other cool things about rock iguanas generally are the toes. Okay. So this is like a, a hook. Looks like a talon to me. So they can, they, they're quite good at climbing trees. Mm -hmm. They don't, they, you know, they spend most of the time on the ground, but they're quite good at climbing trees. And these, these, these claws hang onto things really effectively. And for females digging nests, of course, they're great for digging too. But the, the weird thing is, you know how our hands bend like this? These guys bend like this. Oh, they bend right to left. They don't bend this way. They don't bend this way, but they bend backwards. That is very interesting, Peter. And think about why, because right there, they're constantly pulling this thing through vegetation. And now, Fred, is there any other distinct characteristic about the blue iguana that's worth noting today? I like to mention this little thing here. Okay. You see that little scale there? It looks translucent. I do. So that's the pineal eye. Mm -hmm. And that's a very primitive feature in reptiles, but these aren't primitive animals. Right. Um, light can get through there. And we think that there is a brain receptor in there. And they probably, we don't know this for sure, but we suspect that they use this for tracking day length. And that's how they subconsciously know what time of year it is and the triggers for when they need to start thinking about breeding season and all that sort of thing. Very unique sensory mechanism. Very yeah. cool, Peter. A lot of the stuff that I've described to you is useful because what we need always is for people to relate to these animals. If we want to conserve an animal like this, people need to be engaged in it, right? right? And the thing about an animal like this is it's, it's, it, it responds to us in a way. We can, we can understand it, we can empathize. So knowing about the iguanas helps us tell stories about them. And we tell stories about these iguanas and people start to love them. And if people start to love them, they want us to preserve them. And that's, that's the way it all works. Well, I think Peter has done a phenomenal job today hanging out with us so we can learn more about his species. And as far as lovability, I mean, I think the proof is right here, guys. This is about the coolest customer I've ever witnessed when it comes to an iguana. Thank you very much for hanging out, Peter. And thank you, Fred. Really appreciate the tour of the facility. Great work on bringing back this population of beautiful reptiles. Without the efforts put in place by Fred and now sustained by the National Trust's Blue Iguana Recovery Program, these lizards would almost certainly no longer exist in the wild. What they have done for the blue iguana is truly remarkable and always makes us proud to tell one of these heroic efforts to save such a special creature. If you would like to catch a glimpse of the famous blue iguana for yourself, drop by the Queen Elizabeth II Botanic Gardens website to book a tour with the Blue Iguana Recovery Program, where you can get up close with this endemic species and if you're lucky enough, may even get to meet Peter himself. But just don't disturb him if he's resting. The star of the island needs his beauty sleep. Hey guys, Mario Aldecoa here. And I'm Mark Vins, and welcome to a very special adventure sponsored by our friends at b &H Photo. Mario, what are we doing out here in the middle of the jungle at night? Well, we're gonna do one of our favorite hobbies called night herping. Night herping, well, I know what that means, but I think some people at home might need a little explanation. Night herping very simply is searching for reptiles and amphibians. Actually, we're here at the Costa Rican Amphibian Research Center, one of our favorite locations to search for species in the tropics. That's right. In fact, we've filmed over 40 of our most famous YouTube videos right here mm -hmm. at this location. So needless to say, this place is jam-packed with wildlife, and we thought, hey, let's see just how many animals we can find on a single adventure. And along the way, we might talk about some of the tips and tricks of the trade and how we film animals at night. I'm ready if you're ready. I'm ready. Let's get out there. Starting the adventure. Mario, is this uh, kind of the point of the evening where you start to get, uh, I don't know, a little excited about what you're gonna see? Yeah, as soon as I put the headlamp on and I've got my trusty snake hook in my hand, I am excited and ready to go. So what are you looking for, Mario? Like, what's, what's an indicator of an animal? I just kind of scan slowly as I'm walking, and what you're trying to do is find any difference in texture, color, uh, and contrast, and of course, movement. If something moves, it's probably an animal. And that's your biggest indication that you found something. All right, so we have our first amphibian. It's actually called a dirt frog, probably because of its coloration. Check this little guy out. Oh! oh. <laughs> ah. <laughs> He's talking to me. And I'm gonna let you go. You're cute. Oh! <laughs> 
All right, check this guy out. That is a stick insect or a stick bug. If I didn't actually see it move, I would have probably thought it was. Uh-oh, it's, it's a runaway. Oh, you almost got him here. Uh, where's that? You got him, you got him. I love these. These are one of my favorites. Let's release them right here. So when you're out searching at night, usually you expect to find nocturnal species, but sometimes you actually will find some diurnal species. And of course, when they're out at night, they're usually sleeping. A very common species you encounter are anoles. That's clearly sleeping. He's kind of splayed out on the vegetation. All right, let's continue. Oh, there's a giant cockroach. What? Let me see if I can get it. Oh, I don't know, man. Oh, 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 no, I missed it. Oh, here it is. Got it, got it, got it, got it. Oh, man, dude. Do you want to see what's on your neck? Ready? Put out your hand. Oh. <laughs> that is a really big roach. You know what kind of roach that is? No, a big roach. Papa roach? Papa roach. <laughs> this is the papa roach of roaches. And that is a leaf frog. Oh, look at that little guy. The leaf frogs have the distinct, really large eyes. All right, moving on. Check this out. It may not look like much, or actually it may look like a giant booger attached to this leaf. This gelatinous goo is the developing embryos of a frog species. They actually attach the eggs to the bottom of leaves and the leaves are overhanging on streams. As the embryos develop, little tadpoles will fall down into the stream and continue their metamorphosis into an adult frog. It's amazing because you can actually see the little embryos moving around. All right, look what we have here. Our first snake of the night. The very elegant cat-eyed snake. This is a juvenile. It is an arboreal species, long and slender. So cat-eyed snake has elliptical pupils as a lot of the nocturnal species out here have during the day. If you were to look at its eye, it would be that nice kind of cat-eyed uh, feature or look. So that was our first snake of the night. Uh, we're gonna continue and see if we could find something bigger. Even the scorpions are arboreal here. Oh, cool, check this out. What'd you find? Katie did. Oh, yeah. Kind of looks like it's covered in moss. Now, there's a lot of variations of the Katie dids in a lot of species, and depending on their environment, they can blend in very well, super cryptic. Look at this. This is a really unique lizard species to the tropics. It's called a cask-headed lizard. The name cask implies that right there. So this family of lizards has this big crest on their head and neck area. The tactic that this lizard is employing right now is basically using its cryptic color and lying motionless. Uh, it's just pretending to be part of this branch and hoping that we don't actually touch it or catch it, which we won't. We're gonna leave it be so it could rest uh, and have a good night. All right, we got a fertile lance. Oh, yes. Look at this snake. That is a good one. That is a good size fertile ant. All right, let's approach very slow. See, oh, no, it's moving. That is a big, big venomous snake. Easy, Mario. Take your time, buddy. We just want to actually get it under control. Easy, Mario, easy, easy. Relax, back, relax. Back, back. He's fast, guys, he's fast, he's really nice. Oh, oh, Trent! He almost lost Trent. You all right, buddy? I'm good. He almost, Trent almost found, fell down this ravine, guys. Yeah. All right, Mar Mario, so why are we bagging the snake? All right, we're basically bagging the snake because we have to take it to a more controlled situation. It's, a, it's an extremely dangerous snake, so we don't want to be handling this snake in a tight trail uh, like the one we're on. We're basically one miss step and you're either off or the snake gets you because you have nowhere to go. So what we want to do is uh, safely take this to a location where we can present it uh, in a more open area. All right, let's go. Ready? Yeah, nice. <laughs> let's go ahead and fire up our light kit here. These lights by Light in Motion are absolutely awesome. These are the Stella Pros. 
uh, I'm gonna boost them up to full power to start, 8,000 lumens a piece. The way I know that is they have this nice little LED panel in the back, it tells you the power and the estimated time remaining for the charge of the battery. So we're gonna go down to 5,000. Lights are really important for obvious reasons when you're filming at night. Not only does it expose this scene for your cameras, but it also keeps us safe. Whenever you're working with a dangerous animal like a fair to lance, you want to know what your footing's like. You want to know if there's any other animals around or anything that could distract the presenter or the camera operators. We're going to do a cross pattern tonight. We're going to start with one light out here on the right-hand side, and then we're going to put another light out here on the left-hand side. These are awesome because they're small, compact, lightweight. We've got these Manfrotto tripods. This whole kit can break down, fit right in the backpack that I'm wearing with ease. Got a quick release even, like right here, if I want to take the light off and we want to move it for a different shot. If you're going to be shooting at night, definitely invest in a good, rugged, mobile light kit. Yeah, buddy. That was a little bit intense, or a lot intense, actually. We were in a very precarious situation. A venomous snake in a very tight, narrow pathway with basically a steep hill on one side and a ravine on the other. And one false step, you're going down, just like Trent did. We almost lost Trent. We almost lost Trent. We decided to bag the snake safely and find an area that was open. The key is to have an area you feel comfortable handling this dangerous animal so that the animal is safe and that we are safe. And I think this is gonna be our best spot. Believe it or not, when the snake is in a bag, it is still just as dangerous. In fact, many people are bitten through snake bags. So the thought is, well, the snake is in there, it can't see you, and you're gonna place your hand somewhere. Well, the snake does have heat-seeking pits, and they also respond to movement. So anything that touches the bag, they might actually strike out and envenomate you right through the bag. So Mario, I don't wanna add any pressure to the situation, but I think it's important for everyone at home to know just how dangerous is this snake. The Fertilance is one of the most dangerous snakes here in the tropics. It is responsible for actually 90% of all venomous snake bites. Now the reason for this is because these are very common species. And because these snakes are common, people encounter them on a regular basis. Now the reason why they bite so many people is not because they're super aggressive snakes going out of their way to actually attack a person. Oh, you just bit the snake You just bit the snake hook. Did yeah. you see that? Yeah, I did. What does that mean, Mario? Well, that means the snake's a little upset. So what you just saw there was a snake bit the hook. And that was a very deliberate bite. So let's actually just let it kind of calm down. This venom is a cocktail of some really nasty stuff. And the properties of that venom are basically myotoxins and cytotoxins that are going to destroy tissue. We are talking about necrosis. Often, the bite of a fertilance will require amputation of the limb or the area where the snake bit. Now, the snake is very cryptic in coloration. In fact, the name in Costa Rica for this snake is terciopelo, which actually means velvety skin. And that sheen that you see on the snake looks like velvet, but in fact, the snake scales are keeled. Its pattern and coloration allows it to cryptically camouflage against the leaf litter very well. And unfortunately, an unsuspecting person might walk and step on the animal. The animal will bite in defense. Now, the one thing to notice about the Fertilance is it is a pit viper. So right between the eyes and the nostrils, there is an opening on the snake's head. They're actually heat sensing pits that pick up on warm blooded animals. So if a snake like this were to bite one of us, the only thing to do is to get to medical attention as fast as possible. Uh, you do not want to put a tourniquet on a snake bite like this because it will actually restrict the venom and cause more necrosis potentially. Now the Fertilance is a snake you do not want to encounter and pick up like we are doing, but it is not necessarily a snake that's gonna go after you. Like all snakes, its main goal is to get away and leave you alone. Well, how about that, the infamous Fertilance. The next step is to secure the animal and release it back where we found it. Well, here we are. This is the spot. That's the spot. Man, Definitely. 
What an epic evening out here at the Costa Rican Amphibian Research Center. Once again, found all kinds of animals. We found everything from frogs to lizards to insects, like that giant roach. That was creepy. And of course, the superstar, the Ferdilance. Right. What was that like? That Ferdilance was pretty intense. A very dangerous snake, but a beautiful snake as well. So before we go, we do want to say a special thanks one more time to our friends at B&H Photo for sponsoring this adventure. And don't forget, subscribe and hit the notification bell so you can join us on our next adventure. Welcome to the Sonoran Desert, one of the harshest environments in the continental United States. This terrain has become a staple for brave wilderness. From the Gila monsters to the tarantula hawks, even the plants are out for blood. In fact, that's exactly why we're here. Ah! Ah, yes, here we go. The jumping cholla in all its glory. Now, there are over 30 different species of this segmented cacti that inhabit North and South America, and they all have different names. This one, I can tell right away, is none other than the teddy bear cholla. But I will warn you, this plant is definitely not soft and cuddly so you don't want to give it a hug if you're out here in the Sonoran Desert. Now, if you take a closer look at those spines, you'll notice that they are pointing in nearly every direction, almost like some kind of geometric nightmare. Oh, but it gets worse. On every single spine is a characteristic called glochidia, which are small bristles with backward-facing barbs. This microscopic feature makes the choya difficult to remove once it is adhered to any surface or unlucky passerby. Now I know what you're thinking. Are these plants just plain evil? Or is there a method to their madness? Well, as it turns out, each and every single segment of this plant is a potential seed for the next offspring. They've adopted what's called vegetative reproduction. But what's with this name, Jumping Choya? Their name is a bit of a myth. It comes from the idea that the plants actually have the ability to jump at their would-be victims. However, that's not the case. But what they can do is fall. So a good gust of wind or vibrations in the ground can cause the segments to fall, especially in the dry season. And at this point, I want to show you guys the methods to remove a choya plant from your body. But let's be honest, you've seen this before. Yeah, today it's my turn. And in order to show you the right ways to remove a choya, I'm gonna need to get myself good and spiked up. So the team and I have decided to create the ultimate choya challenge, also called the sharpest maze in the world. And if you look right behind me here, you'll notice there's a lot of choya. In fact, not just choya, there's all kinds of spiky nightmarish plants. These are things you would never, ever want to walk through. But here's the deal, if you were to go all the way to the end of the maze, over 100 yards, you would find a table. What's on this table, you might ask? Well, it just so happens to be my favorite dessert of all time. The delicious, the scrumptious, the completely irresistible red velvet cake. And this one just so happens to be made from my favorite bakery in Los Angeles, Baker's Lane. So trust me, I really wanna have that dessert in the desert. But here's the deal, in order to get it, I need to make my way through this maze in under two minutes. And the kicker is, I've got to do it while being blindfolded. Actually, Mark, I thought the blindfold might be a little too easy to see through. Huh? So uh, I got you these blacked out goggles instead. I'm gonna take that bandana from you. I could work with this, okay. I really want that cake. All right, folks, here it goes. If you've ever wanted to see a human pincushion, stick around for the next few minutes. This is about to get crazy. Alrighty, folks, looks like we got ourselves a good old-fashioned desert showdown. No sense poking around. Let's get right to it. Two minutes on the clock. Let's give him some spins for good luck. And he's off. Ah! Ah! Oh, that's bad, man. Straight, straight. To your right, to your right. Good, good. Straight. To your left, Mark. To your left. 
Straight. Yep, straight ahead. Oh, watch out for that one by your leg. Oh. Ah. Back up just a little bit and then go straight. Ah. There you go. Oh, I can't see a thing. Ah. There we go. We got a little bit of a clearing time here. Time check. Time check. Uh, you got about a minute 30. Ah. Oh. Ah. Watch your chin. Ah. Which way? Oh. oh, man. Back up, back up, back up. Oh. 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 Okay, Mark, we got to keep All going. Right. To your right, to your right. To right, right. 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 Oh, what yeah. is that? That's not another one, is it? No. Nope. Ah. Straight ahead. Ah. Yep, side step. Step with ah. your left leg forward. Ah. Yeah, just go straight, Mark. Just go straight. Oh my gosh, how far am I? Halfway through, Mark. Ah. Come on. Don't get too close to those. Keep oh shuffling. My God. There you go. My, my leg's seizing up, man. Well, we're in between two ah. very sharp plants. So ah. What we need to do. Yep. Ah. You just turned yourself perfect. Okay. Go forward. Ah. There's a bush right below you, though. Step over that with your left leg. Uh, there you go. I guess why I do the right thing. I can't. Yeah. I'm just trying to feel for bushes shuffle, with my feet. Shuffle. There you go. Uh, am I close? You're close. We got about 30 uh, seconds though. We got to make it. Uh, uh, I'm like terrified to finish this, Corey. Help me. All right. This part's uh, tight. Ah, uh, dude, I'm stuck. I'm freaking stuck. Uh, oh, he's gonna feel that one for a while. Let's slow that down real nice, like, and see an instant replay. Okay, you just have to move forward. You're right there. It's right in front of you. Oh, I feel the table. I ah, got the cake. Yes. Victory. Oh, dude, you made it with like two seconds to spare. All right. I need you guys to remove the goggles because I'm like, I can't move right now. Corey, I'm going to need your help. How bad is it? How bad is it? It's bad, dude. Oh! Oh my goodness! Was it worth it, man? Let Take a bite. Let me see. You made mm. it this far. Oh! Oh, it makes it better. That certainly makes it better. Oh yeah, that's a good cake. Okay. We gotta get these out. <laughs> All right, I really need the stuff off the back. I'm just gonna keep going, man. Ready? Okay. Oh. <laughs> All right, keep going, man. Had you ever thought oh. starting over? Starting One, two, three. Again. Oh. Yep, that was the worst one. <clears throat> Tell you guys what, I am so happy I wore a cup. Okay, so here we go. Now, as you can see, I only have the Choya left that are on the front side of my body. And this is the point of the video where I would like to attempt to show you how, if this happens to you, hopefully it doesn't, but if it does, how to properly remove these Choya with the least amount of pain possible. The number one thing you want to avoid doing, this is like rule number one with Choya, you never, ever, under any circumstances, try to remove Choya with your hands. Even if you have gloves on, as you can see, these things go through boots, they go through fabric. So don't use your hands, you want to use a tool. Now, what tool should you use? Well, I'm glad you asked. Corey, my comb, please. Thank you, sir. No, I'm just kidding. It's not for my hair, but one of the best tools for removing the Choya is a large tooth comb just like this. Work the teeth under the spines until you grab the choy. You could kind of see I've got the fruit pulling up now. Ready? One, two, three. Whew. Okay, that's one. Oh, this one's gonna hurt. Go! Oh, yeah! Yes! Yes, sir, that hurts. Okay, so the comb, it does the trick. But let's be honest, if you're out here hiking the Sonoran Desert, pretty good chance you don't have a large tooth comb in your kit. 
But what you might have is something like this. The Brave Wilderness team never leaves home without a good multi-tool, and I highly recommend you do the same. So you wanna open two points of contact, just like the comb, wiggle it in there, see how I have good purchase. Ah, that hurts. One, two, three. Velvet cake, velvet cake, velvet cake. Uh. Ah. Oh. Ah. Okay, I think I need to get this one off. This is a good opportunity for me to show you yet another technique. Corey, sticks please. Thank you, sir. Now, if you can't find any sticks, just look harder, because you definitely don't want to use your hands, like I said before. What you want to do is take the sticks, work them underneath, get purchase, and then same as the other ones. One, two, three. Oh, yeah. Just like that. But I got to be honest with you. I much prefer the multi-tool, so I'm going back. Okay. This is going to be a good one. <laughs> and the final, Choya. I hope you've enjoyed learning about the Sonoran Desert and all of its spiky inhabitants and how to remove the pesky choya should you ever have an encounter of your own. I'm Mark Vins. Be brave. Stay wild. We'll see you on the next challenge. Ready, guys? One, two, three. Ah! <laughs> mm -mm. Oh, yes, that cake was worth every single spine. And speaking of our spiky little friends that joined me on today's adventure, we actually did them a big favor by helping these choya complete their journey across the desert. Grow strong, little ones. And if you enjoyed this challenge, make sure to head over to the Mark Vins channel and check out my experiment to prove once and for all who is the spikiest cactus in the West. Ow. I'm just gonna say it right now, it only gets spikier from here.